All right, open your Bible, if you would, to the Gospel of John. <clears throat> and we are going to continue our series on the topic of prayer. And uh, it's always so exciting. I uh, was sitting in my study even the other day, and I was, uh, as I was reading and, and praying and reading and praying and reading and praying, and, and uh, I, I mentioned something on Facebook, how much I have, I, I've got a long way to go, long way to grow. And, uh, and I'm so thankful that God is working in my life. And, uh, and I just pray that these messages will, will affect you the same way that it's affecting me. And uh, so today I've titled the, uh, the, titled the message, The Foundation of Prayer. Uh, last week we looked at the function of prayer. I mentioned to you that prayer is communication with God. As a whole, it's us talking to him. And we have all sorts of times where we can pray. We pray uh, for our, our food. Uh, that's probably one of, one of the most common things you find in America. I remember when I was a, when I was a, a kid, we had this, uh, had this prayer. It, was, it, it is what it is, uh, but it was a prayer. It was a short, simple thing we repeated over and over and over again. It had to, almost no depth, no sincerity. And if you say this prayer, then... Uh, I'll forgive you, <laughs> but I remember we would pray, we'd say, uh, we'd say this, we'd, 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 right before we'd eat, we'd say, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, and, and let this food to us be blessed. And uh, while that is uh, true, and there is meaning there, we said it with no meaning, uh, but that was communicating, if you will, in a sense, to God. It's thanking God for the food that we're about to eat. Uh, we pray before we go to bed. We pray sometimes when we wake up. I don't know how many of you pray when you wake up in the morning. I do a lot of praying when I wake up. I, I, I don't even open my eyes. And my first prayer is, Lord, help me to open my eyes. <laughs> that is the first step to getting out of bed. And uh, so I pray, and, and I ask the Lord for, for guidance throughout the day. I ask him for help, and, and I think of my, my to-do list uh, throughout the day. And I say, Lord, I've got these, these appointments. I have these meetings. I have these things. I have these goals and objectives. And uh, Lord, I just need your help with them. And, uh, and then I begin to pray, Lord, uh, I hope that these are your goals and objectives. Because if not, we will fail. And uh, so these are conversations that I have. So prayer is essentially just communicating with God. And that's what we talked about last week, the function of prayer. Well, this morning I'm talking about the foundation of prayer, the foundation of prayer. Uh, as a uh, former contractor, I can tell you that a good foundation is important to the integrity of the whole structure. And if we don't have a good foundation, the building will fail. And uh, I remember I, I purchased, I can't even tell you how many homes I bought in my life, and uh, some of them were for me, and some of them were for an investor out of Chicago. We would buy the homes with the hopes of, of, uh, of rehabbing them, and then, uh, and then renting them out, and then with a, with a goal to, uh, to sell them at the end. And, and, uh, and it, was, uh, it was kind of a, a fun thing, but we bought a lot of homes. And I remember there were times, there were times that uh, we, would, we would drive by a home, and no joke, I wouldn't even get out of the car. <laughs> uh, you know, it always looks really good on the, on the MLS, and, and, and you're looking at the sheet, and, and it's like, oh, that looks all right, you know, and it's kind of a, a black and white picture, kind of fuzzy, and, and you're not really sure until you drive up, and and, uh, you know, you drive up to this, uh, this building you think is going to be nice, and, and, uh, and I can say to, to the realtor, just, just keep driving, just keep, just keep driving. And they say, you don't want to get out to look at it? And I said, don't need to. I've seen everything I need to see. And, uh, and one of the, the main things I, I would look for is foundation problems. And uh, invariably, the foundation problems would seep into the structure, ironically. So I would see, uh, I would see these gutters that were kind of giving an eyebrow look to you, and and these roof lines that had all this gnarly kind of pitches and sagging things. And, and even if I did go into the house, I would notice drywall that was, that was all cracked in certain, places, in certain places, which to me indicates a foundation problem. Now, generally we wouldn't buy those homes. We would just uh, uh, forget about them, check them off the list, unless the price of the home it would reflect the, the cost it would take to repair the foundation. So generally we would just, we would just kind of omit those ones. And here's what I'm saying. I say when we look at prayer, we must remember some foundational things. We must remember who we are praying to and who we are that is praying. 
These are foundational things, and if we get this wrong, our foundation is going to need some repair. We need to, we need to do a, a, a kind of a check on, on how we view God and how we view ourselves. And here's where this message is going this morning. We're going to do a little, um, do a little back to the basics, a little, a little basic training. And uh, we're going to get into some theology this morning, and I don't want this to paralyze you. Years ago, I, I taught a, a Sunday school called Doctrine is Not a Dirty Word. And uh, doctrine isn't dirty. Do- doctrine is a good thing. Because the more we know about who God is, we know more about his predictability. We know how he's going to act. Right? So doctrine is a good thing. We can look at these things. And when it comes to prayer, knowing what God can do begins by knowing who he is. We must know who he is. How can you pray to somebody you don't know can even answer your prayer? Or maybe, in effect, he doesn't have your best interest in mind. So we have to know who God is. And unfortunately, in today's culture, we have a very twisted view of God. It's just true. I talk to Christians and non-Christians alike who, 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 who view God as a, as, as, uh, as a tyrant. They, they look at God as a, as a hateful, resentful, heavy-handed, mean-spirited, <clears throat> close-fisted, uh, tyrannical God. And can I just assure you this morning that while God does judge sin, God has a whole lot more attribute to him than just judgment and just righteousness. And so this morning, we are going to look at a few of those things, and I hope that this will change your impression of God. That when you pray for something, you're not going to say, oh boy, I'm going to pray for this, and hopefully, my wife and I were talking the other day, and she says, you know, oftentimes when people pray for patience, they they say, oh, don't pray for patience, because if, if you pray for patience, man, God is coming after you. Now listen, that's not my God. It's not the God of the Bible. Now, may there be trials in your life when you pray for patience? Absolutely. May there be things that you go through. May may you go through the, 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 the valley of the shadow of death? Yes. But the Lord is with you when you do that. And so we want to have a correct view of God. So this morning, I'm going to give you two quick points and try to get you out of here before one. Amen. First of all, let's look at your verse sheet and let's talk about the faithfulness of the Savior. The faithfulness of the Savior. Now listen, friends. God's love, God's goodness, and God's mercy are are foundational. They're foundational. And it's important to have this foundation when we view a faithful Savior. Especially when we talk about a faithful Savior who answers prayer. Without knowing some of these characteristics, why would you even pray? Ask yourself, why would I pray to a God that does not love me? Why would I pray to a God that is not good? And certainly, why would I pray for mercy to a God who isn't merciful? So when we look at these characteristics, these are good things. We can can bring into view some of God's love and his goodness and his mercy. Listen, I'm not going to pray to an unfaithful Savior. I am not going to pray to a God who hates me, isn't good, and doesn't show mercy. I, I wouldn't even pray to him. But we have a faithful Savior. Let's look, first of all, at his limitless love. At his limitless love. He has eternal love. In John 13, 1, it says that having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. You see, knowing the eternal love of God changes our view of how he answers prayer. Knowing that he has a limitless eternal love, I can pray to God in faith knowing that he loves me and that there is nothing that I can do to shake that love. In Romans 8, Verse 38, nothing can separate us, it says, from the love of God, not even our sin. Did you know God loves you the same today as he did yesterday and as he will tomorrow? 
I am so thankful that my, that my sin does not shake the Savior, that I can go to him and say, Lord, I apologize, I want to get right with you, but throughout it all, he never stopped loving me. And praise God for that. I wouldn't pray to a God who didn't love me. And when we begin to bring into view his love that he has for us, it makes it easy to pray to him, doesn't it? I would petition all day long someone who loves me with an eternal, limitless love. But his love is more than just eternal. It's a great love. It's a great love. In Ephesians 2.4, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Now there are some really great things about God. Can I say that this morning? There are some really great things. But one of the greatest of all is love. He has a limitless, eternal, and great love for His people. A great love. But it's more than just an eternal love and a great love. It's a sacrificial love. 1 John 3.16, not to be confused with John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16, Hereby perceive we the love of God. This is how we perceive the love of God. Because He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He laid His life down for us, and that's how we perceive God's love. God's love is a sacrificial love. God could have an eternal love, a great love, and had not it been for his sacrifice, it would be insufficient. I am thankful that our God in heaven has a sacrificial love. He lays his life down for us. And when I think about my God, I think about how he loves me with an eternal, great love and sacrificial love. He doesn't want anything from us. A sacrifice is when He lays it down apart from His desire for Himself. One commentator said this, there is no selfishness in divine love. God has never sought benefit for Himself. He receives nothing. He bestows everything. Now that's a God I can pray to. That's a God that I can pray to, that I can go to morning, noon, and night and say, Dear God, I know you loved me, and you do love me, and will continue to love me despite me. And I can pray to you. I wouldn't pray to an unfaithful Savior. But He has more than just limitless love. He has grand goodness. And here are some verses for you to ponder. Uh, Psalm 145, 16 through 17. Thou openest thy hand and satisfies the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy in all His works. Romans 2.4 Or despiseth thou the, rich, the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You know what that means? That means God's goodness will lead us to change your mind. Because God is so good that when we are so bad, we look to him and say, Lord, you are so good. And, and because of that, because of your goodness, I'm changing my mind. I'm no longer looking at him as a wicked, evil, tyrannical, heavy-handed, close-fisted God. I'm looking at him as he is a God who is good and who loves me. Exodus 34, 6, the Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. It's abundant. He's not lacking in goodness. When we say that we have a good God, what we really mean is He is a great God. He is a great God, an amazing one who loves us and is good to us. Just His goodness alone should provoke us to pray and to praise Him for who He is. I wouldn't pray to an unfaithful Savior. I'm so thankful that He loves me. You hear people all the time and they, they, they say, I struggle with praying. And so here they are, they struggle with praying and I say, well, what's your view of God? And boy, that answers a lot of questions when they tell me their view of God. 
They might say, oh, yes, yes, God is love. And the Bible says that. And I'm thankful for that. And God is love and he loves the world, but maybe he doesn't love me all the same. It's sad to hear Christians talk like that because they have a twisted, distorted view of God. Nothing can separate us from that love. Limitless, eternal, and he's good. Let's look at this one as well. He has measureless mercy. I wouldn't pray to a God who didn't have mercy. Why would you pray to a merciless God? What would you ask him for? Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I wouldn't pray that prayer to someone who didn't show mercy. Because he didn't have any mercy to show. But the God of the Bible has measureless mercy. It's immeasurable. It's overflowing. It's, it's consistent and constant. It's everything we need from a God we can have faith in and we can pray to. Look at Deuteronomy 4.31. The Bible says that for the Lord thy God is a merciful God. Psalm 103.8 says the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and get this, plenteous, plenteous in mercy. He has plenty of mercy to go around. He's not limited. He doesn't don't cap the mercy of God. Psalm 103, 17, uh, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. We talked about limitless love, right? This is limitless mercy. This is from the beginning of time to the end of time, and you're never going to have a prayer that fits outside the purview of, of, of everlasting. Every time you pray and go to God and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, he has the ability and the desire, can I say that, to show you mercy? It's an everlasting mercy. Psalm uh, 105, verse 8, the Bible says that the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. This is great, slow to anger and of great mercy. People read this, and I mean, I think it shocks people, but when you ask somebody, they say he, he, he actually lacks compassion, and he's quick to anger, and he lacks mercy. And it says he's full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. See, we have a twisted view of our Heavenly Father. And the way we... Psalm 105, or 145, verse 8, ought to resonate with you. It ought to hit you right in the soul and you better say, Lord, I understand that you are, are full of compassion. You ever have something that's full? Full to the brim? Now that's not in the Hebrew, but I'm telling you, it's there. Full to the brim? It's not like he lacks a little bit, you know? Uh, the other day, Brooks and I went out to, uh, we went out to breakfast at, what is this, the family something? Yeah, family restaurant. Awesome. They bring me a, a glass of orange juice. I set it on the table, table and they, I mean, it was, it was full to the brim. I almost had to put my you know, lips down and, and serve almost, you know, and, 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 and she says, well, it's full. And I say, well, at least I got what I paid for, you know, or something like that. And she smiled and walked away. And, and uh, that is what we call full. It's not lacking. And friends, can I tell you that we have a God who does not lack in his compassion. He's compassionate to us, and he's of great mercy, and he wants to display that mercy to us. He wants to give us that mercy, and that mercy is, is, is open for people to ask, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And we're going to talk about that in later lessons as well. He's full of compassion. This is a God I can pray to. I can pray to a faithful Savior. One who has this full compassion. One who has this great mercy. In Psalm 136, verse 1, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. The reason for giving thanks unto the Lord is because of His goodness. Do you see that? If He did nothing else at all, we can go to God and say, Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Your mercy endures forever. This is the kind of God I can pray to. And often when we lack prayers, when we are not praying as we ought to pray, it's because we don't understand some of these basic concepts. 
And the more that the Lord teaches me and instructs me personally as an individual, as a pastor, I'm in my office yesterday even and, and saying, Lord, uh, I'm, I'm praying to him and asking things. And I can look back at Psalm 136 verse 1 and I can say, praise God for your goodness. God isn't just out to get you, you know? He's not just, he's not just uh, waiting for you to, to, to mess up so he can slap you in the face, to punish you. He's out to show his benevolent mercy to us. I wouldn't pray to an unfaithful Savior. I wouldn't ask him for anything. If he were unfaithful, if he wasn't loving, if he wasn't good, if he wasn't merciful, it would be a complete waste of time to pray. It would be a complete waste of time to pray. R.A. Torrey said, time spent in prayer is not wasted, but time invested at big interest. Praise God for that. Praise God that when, when we pray, we are, we, are, we are investing. We're not wasting. Because he's faithful. I thank God he's that way. I thank God that when I go to him in my quiet time and I begin to ask him things, I can begin to examine and thank him for his goodness. I can begin to thank him for his mercy. I can begin to thank the Lord for his love. Without, the, without those, I wouldn't pray at all. And I don't think you would either. I would be afraid of praying to somebody who is unfaithful. What would they give me in exchange for a prayer? Except wrath. I'm thankful for the Savior and His faithfulness. Let's look at the failure of the sinner. Point two, the failure of the sinner. If it wasn't for the failures of the sinner, there would be no need for the faithfulness of the Savior. We have to have a right view of ourselves. Can I, there's, a, there's a movement in America uh, called low self-esteem. And uh, people say there's a self-esteem issue in America. Can I tell you this? There is a self-esteem issue in America. And it's not because of a low self-esteem. It's a high self-esteem. It's because people think of themselves more highly than they ought to think. We call that pride. We talked a little bit about that in Sunday school. People have a high self-esteem. And they think of themselves better, and they think of themselves as kind of on top and supreme and preeminent. And their right view of who we are in light of a holy God should clear that up because He is way better than we are. Our sin demands a penalty that only the Savior can pay. And so we need a faithful Savior. We need a faithful Savior, one that we can rely on, one who loves us, one who has grand goodness and measureless mercy. I mentioned last week a quote by a guy named John R. Rice, and, and I, I really love his stuff. And, and he said uh, in his book, Prayer, Asking and Receiving, he said that my, fra my failures are all prayer failures. And can I just broaden that just a little bit and say this, that that, that all my failures are always related to my sin. My failures are always sin failures. And prayerlessness is one of those sin failures when I'm not praying as I ought to pray. So we're going to look at a couple of these failures here uh, this morning, and hopefully you'll see yourself in light of a holy God. Uh, let's talk about the sin of independence. The sin of independence uh, Adam and Eve didn't start there, but that's where they ended up, didn't they? They ended up independent from God. Matthew 4.4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There is supposed to be a codependency on our Savior. Uh, one commentator said, Humans support 
de- uh, depends not upon bread, but upon God's unfailing word of promise and pledge of all needful uh, providential care. Basically, we're not to live independent of God. And we have this, uh, this sin in our lives where we want to be separate from God. I see Christians doing this. I see Christians who want their independence from God. Well, God is the one that saved them to begin with. Now you want dependence from Him. In, you want independence. You want to be as far away from God because we don't want, to, we don't want God to invade our lives. We want to be independent from Him. In John 15, 5, without me you can do nothing. In Matthew 19, 26, but with God all things are possible. You can't do anything without God, but with Him you can do everything. And we don't want to pray to Him. We don't have time for Him. And so this is a good reminder of not to be independent from God. We need, our, we need codependency on Him. We need Him morning, noon, and night. We ought to have that still small voice that we're talking to. I know when I begin to pray, I, I, I really begin to pray when I, when I visualize myself on my knees before Him and the cross. When I really begin to pray, I view who I am in light of who He is. He is not my equal. He goes far beyond that. And when I begin to really connect with God, is when I begin to relinquish my independence from Him. It's when I begin to depend on Him. So we have this sin of independence. We have the sin of idolatry. Having no other gods, right? This is someone or something that you give preeminence to. It's not just a commandment. They go hand in hand with the sin of independence. We want to get away from God... Now track with me. We want to get away from God because we elevate ourselves above God. Adam and Eve even placed their independence from God above a dependence upon Him. And then we have the sin of immorality. Here's the downward spiral. This independence and idolatry just lead to immorality. When you leave the light places, we'll end up in darkness. When we leave the light places, we'll end up in darkness. There's no other place to go. So we step away from God. We get away from a life dependent on Him. We want our independence. We elevate something or someone above God. And if He is light and in Him is no darkness at all, then we get away from God. And where are we? In darkness. And we don't pray as we ought to pray. We don't love Him as we ought to love Him because we are independent from Him. Then we have the sin of ignorance. Uh, This is sort of like the sin of omission. This is not doing something that we should. And the uh, the sin of irresponsibility. This would be similar to the sin of commission. This is doing something that we shouldn't. So whether it's the sin of independence, idolatry, immorality, ignorance, or irresponsibility, we end up elevating someone, something above God. We want, dependent, or, uh, we, w- we want to be away from Him, independent from Him, so that we can live our lives as we choose. Sounds like a sad place to be. Now let me give you some application in closing. Prayer is the opposite of independence. Prayer is the opposite of independence. It's total dependence upon God. When we are praying to Him and asking Him for something, we are relinquishing our, uh, our, our concept of, Lord, we can provide for ourselves. We are looking to God saying, Lord, we know that only you can provide what we need. And so I am trusting you, depending on you, relying upon you to answer my prayer. Prayer is the opposite of independence. Prayer is the opposite of idolatry. Because we are looking to God. We are looking to God. It's kind of reverting back, if you will, to to a a perfect state, isn't it? 
Doesn't it breed when you're praying almost like a utopia? And follow with me here. Because you are walking and talking with the Lord. Is that not what God created us to do? To walk and to talk with Him? That's why prayer feels so good, doesn't it? That's why when you begin to pray, you say, Wow, Lord, I felt like I just really connected with you today. And, and you're having these conversations, continual conversations, with God before Him, saying, Lord, I just love you, and I'm thankful, and you're so good to me. And He's getting glorified. And you're enjoying, the, uh, you're enjoying the communion with Him. This wonderful conversation. It feels so good to pray because you're walking and talking with God, just like Adam and Eve were before they fell. It's a shame at the very, very end of our rope is when we revert to prayer. And we don't begin to pray when, when, when we get on the rope. We pray at the very end. R.A. Torrey said, prayer often avails where everything else fails. Then why don't we begin with prayer? I know in my life, when, when I'll be doing something and I'll be, I'll be struggling with it. I'll be, I'll be struggling. And I, I'm telling you, I'm a sinner. <laughs> I'm the worst of them in here. And I'll, I'll begin to struggle. And my prayers won't start out with, Lord, help me. It'll be like, Lord, why aren't you helping with this thing anyway? You know? <laughs> and, and you've got to imagine God in heaven laughing at me, going, uh, not, not laughing at me like, ha-ha, look at you, but more like, ha-ha-ha. <laughs> you should have started there in prayer. We always revert to prayer when we ought to start with it. And this is a theme in our lives. It's a theme in my life. It's a sad theme, but it is a theme. It's, it's, it's what, what we do, what I do. And I do it over and over and over again. Isn't, in, isn't the definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results? And we wonder why our circumstances never change. Have you prayed about it before you entered into the circumstances? Did you pray when you get up in the morning? And then I'm thinking to myself, Lord, I, I actually didn't pray this morning. I got up too fast, my alarm, and blah, 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 and I missed my time with you. Prayer is, is the key to communion. It's the key to communion. If you want to commune with our Lord, we need to be in a state of prayer all the time. Pray without ceasing. We talked about that last week. Having a dialogue, an ongoing dialogue, is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Isn't an ongoing dialogue wonderful? Not a monologue. Not a monologue. Now, I, I've mentioned maybe this story years ago, but I was dating a girl in college in, in northern Minnesota, and, and uh, well, I wasn't really dating her. She was just a friend, more of a friend. I guess she would think we were dating, but anyway. Um, she called me one time and while she was driving, and uh, this is the kind of, kind of girl who just kind of just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And, talk. And, and it was fine. I know guys like that as well. Joel is very much like that. No, kidding. Joel doesn't do that. But anyway, so, uh, so this girl, she, 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 calls, she calls me and she's driving from, uh, I don't know, Grand Forks, North Dakota to somewhere else. Anyway, uh, and I never got a word in. And the call dropped. And I just waited. I wasn't going to call her back. I wasn't going to call her back. And, uh, and finally, she called me back, okay, when she realized I wasn't on the phone. You know what I'm saying? And uh, how long do you think that time was <laughs> between when she, she didn't hear a response because she was monologuing? It was, it was well over 15 minutes. And she, she called me. She's like, oh, I'm sorry, Joe. I didn't realize the phone died. And I thought, just keep going on where you <laughs> Off. It was horrible, but it was. But it's a true story. And God likes a He likes a dialogue, doesn't He? He talks to us through the Word of God. We talk to Him through prayer. We talk. He talks to us through the Word of God. We talk to Him through prayer. Our sinfulness gets in the way of that. Our sinfulness, our self-centeredness, gets in the way of Him talking to us and us talking to Him. I thank God for a faithful Savior. 
but we have failures as a sinner. And our failures as a sinner keep us from having a right relationship with Him, especially with regards to eternity. If you're here today and you don't know where you're going when you die, I want to show you a quick illustration. I want you to focus for the next two minutes. Do that for me, would you? Because this is the most important thing you'll ever hear. It just is. It's not because I'm saying it, but it's because it's being said. If anyone said this, it would be just as important. And when Jesus said this, it was just that important. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that God loves us, but hates our sin. We looked at His limitless love, didn't we? His, his eternal love. He loves us with a perfect love, but He hates our sin. Our sin is what separates us from God. Our sin is what keeps us from going to heaven when we die. The Bible says that God loves us, hates our sin, but He says that the wages of this sin is death. That's the penalty for sin, is death. Someone has to die. Now, there are churches that say if you turn over a new leaf, they use a word called repent, and they say if you turn over a new leaf, if you turn away from sin. There are some churches that say if you give money to a church. There are some churches that will say, well, if you're a good little boy, or, or if you do this or that, or walk little old ladies across the street, uh, this sin will be paid for. But the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to die on a cross because the wages of sin was death. It wasn't church membership. It wasn't walking an aisle or praying a prayer. It was death. Someone had to die. And the Bible says, For by grace are you then saved. Listen to this. By faith. It's not by works. The Bible's clear about that. Where it says, Not by works of righteousness, which you have done, which I have done, but according to God's mercy, His measureless mercy, right? He died for us. He died in our place because He loved us and is merciful to us. He is a good guy, isn't He? He is a great God. And 2,000 years ago, He came to die on the cross to make a payment because the wages of sin is death. He paid for our sin debt. And the Bible says that for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not by being good. It's not by coming to church or walking an aisle or praying a prayer. It's when you believe, simple belief, that Jesus died on the cross, He was buried, and He rose again three days later. He couldn't stay dead because He's God. He came back from the grave to prove to His Father that that payment was sufficient for Him and for us. Isn't that wonderful? That we can come to the place where we have trusting, where we are trusting in Jesus to save us. And friends, if you're here today and you have never done that, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I'm, I'm, I'm begging you to trust Him today, to believe in the quietness of your own mind that Jesus paid it all. That He paid your sin debt. That He died on the cross for you. Simple belief in Jesus that His death, His burial, His resurrection was enough for you is enough to, to, to get you to heaven forever. Because He's a good God and a loving God. He has measureless mercy, but we are sinners and we need help. We need a Savior, someone to save us. So if you're here today and you have never done that, I encourage you to trust Christ today as your personal Savior. Will you do that?